This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Manny Edwards Ministries, North Queensland, Australia. Before we get into the word, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to hear any future content. If you would like to partner with us to spread the gospel to thousands of viewers worldwide, contact us at Manny Edwards Ministries at gmail.com. Revelations 14, 14. Before we begin, I just want you to understand the context of the passage of Scripture we're going to look at. John at the island of Patmos is talking about a very specific time in humanity. He is talking about a time, he refers it to the day of the Lord. That's what he calls it. He says, I was up in the spirit and the first voice that I heard that spoke with me was a trumpet. So he's talking about this terminology we call DOA or it's called the Day of Atonement. Another word phrase you will find in the Bible is called the Day of the Lord. This is very specific type of language. So when we apply that understanding in the Word, we've got to know why John is saying this and the purpose of this harvest. Now, if I can say anything this morning, this, I'd like to say, who's received Jesus this morning? Put your hand up. Everyone frightened, put their hand up. <laughs> yeah, you have Jesus. If you believe that He is the Lord and Saviour of your life and you've received Him as your personal Saviour this morning and that the precious, precious blood of the Lamb has washed you, redeemed you and set you apart for this very purpose, you have Jesus in your life. Now, when you get Jesus, you get all of Him. You get all of Jesus. You don't just get Jesus as His toe or His finger. You get Jesus, He's in you. And when you're born again, I want to say this, that Nicodemus come to Jesus in the book of John chapter 3 and Nicodemus was an old man. He was 83 years of age, they say at this time. And he came to Jesus by night. And Nicodemus said, Jesus, how do you be born, how do you be born again? I'm a, he says, how can a 40-year-old man go back into his mother's womb? Nicodemus understood law. But Nicodemus couldn't understand the language that Jesus was talking to him. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, he says, How do you not know this, Nicodemus, you who are supposed to be a teacher of, of Israel? Nicodemus sitting there, 80 something years of age, talking to Jesus at night, late at night. Nicodemus was shamed to go to Jesus. He was challenged by the understanding of this man, Jesus. And Jesus said, unless you were born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. Unless you were born of water, Passover. Born of water. Old Testament, they would put them into the water. That was referred to as the Passover. Unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, which is the Feast of Pentecost, where you get empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a better life. Natural manifestation is that you get the gift of tongues. You get gifts and the anointing is upon you. But that's only the anointing. It's not the glory. People can muck around in the anointing. Oh, Pastor Manny, that's pretty heavy. No, this is real today. People can muck around in the anointing. Hotnai and Phidiphus was doing that. They were children of the high priest Eli. And they were mucking around and playing around with women out the gate. And Hopni and Phinephus was yet still ministering in the house of God. I'm saying this for you to understand that even with the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a boundary, a limit on what God will allow somebody who is born of the Spirit, born, born of water and also born of the Spirit. We call that Passover the Pentecost life. You're born again. You've received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. You walked on a little bit further. You were then empowered by the Holy Spirit. He came into your life. And now you have the Holy Spirit. He teaches, counsels, leads you into all truth. He gives you gifts. He applies the anointing in your life. But even in that dimension, the Holy Spirit can only do so much. 
He has all power and all authority, but it's up to the individual how much they want to know God. So even with the Holy Spirit in your life, you can pray. You can have the gift of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. You can prophesy with the gift of the Holy Spirit. I see this in your life. I see that to come to pass. You can have revelation in this time and this season. You can have dreams and visions. But all of this is only regarded as the anointing. And we are so encapsulated by the anointing that that's all we know. But in the anointing, I didn't realize that in the anointing you can muck around. You have men and women in the ministry that are no longer here. Men that led mega ministries upon the world and they fell to fornication or they fell to adultery and yet they were filled with the Holy Spirit, prayed in the tongues of the Holy Spirit, prophesied in the Holy Spirit, had revelation, dreams and vision and yet they still fell. That tells me the anointing is not the end result of God's word. We're here this morning. Well, Pastor Manny, what happens after the water and the Spirit? Jesus told Nicodemus this. He said this in John chapter 3. He said, unless you are born of water, Passover, born of the Spirit, Pentecost, hold up, one more. He said, water, Spirit. He said, unless you also enter the kingdom. Now, the Greek word enter there means to become one with this realm of his kingdom. See, Passover, Pentecost is church life. We have gifts, according to Ephesians chapter 4, we have gifts to operate in the church. Prayer, worship, intercession, truth of the word, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, all of these guys, the fivefold ministry, they're regarded as a church ministry. But people of God, there's something bigger than this level of ministry. Can I put it out there? Something bigger than that. Now I'm a pastor and I've got a function in the church. I've got to work the work, I've got to do the ministry, show love and kindness, servanthood to all. All of these things are there for me to work my earthly ministry. But beyond the earthly ministry is the heavenly calling what God's heart and intention is for all of humanity. There's more than being a pastor, more than being an apostle. Yes. There is more. What's the more, Pastor Manny? The more is when we give birth to the full stature of the perfect man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey. Hey. You're going to look like him. You're going to talk like Him. You're going to walk like Him. For when you see Him, you shall be like Him. There's an experience in your life that's about to unfold. And God, it all began when He put this little seed into your life. And the seed has been growing. And the Holy Spirit has come. And there's been cultivating, pruning and watering going on in your life. But all of this little process, God has been maturing the life of the seed to bring forth this mature character. God is waiting for the fruit. We all want the pruning, the cultivating and the watering. We want all the revelation and the working of the Word in our life. But ultimately, we've got to go on. The fruit has to be produced in our life. What's the fruit, Pastor Manny? The full character of sonship. It's the nature of Christ within us, revealed through us in its totality. What do you mean? You are to be exactly like your father. That's why Jesus could say it. Jesus said, you will do greater works than me. How could Jesus say that? You will do greater works than me because what I have begun in your life is only in seed form. Ultimately, you will give birth to this character. 
I've started it, I've put it in you as seed form. When you were born again, he put it into your spirit. Some of us don't even know this. The church doesn't understand. Nicodemus couldn't understand it. He said, how can I go back up into my mother's womb? Jesus said, no, unless a man is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into this realm of the kingdom, not the church, the kingdom age. When you were born again, your spirit was born again. When you received Jesus, guess what happened? You didn't get go back up into your mother's womb. Inside of you, your spirit was born again. Your spirit man, we know very little about the character of our spirit man. Our spirit man is born, and I tell you what, in him is the fullness of this character. What's in there? The character is Christ. In Pentecost, we only get the anointing part of that. It comes and touches our spirit and our soul and we work and we prophesy and we heal people and all of those things like that. But up in this dimension where we're going to, this is full character. Do you mean we won't sin? Yes. Do you mean these things won't be able to touch us? Yes. That's why Paul was crying out that prayer. He said, oh wretched man that I am. He said, I see another law in my members. I see something else working in me. He was talking about this other law. The law of sin and death was operating in Paul's life. And he was sitting down in the core of his soul. This law. But I tell you what, God's going to turn this tap on up here in your spirit and it's going to come down and begin to deal with this law. That's why we keep on sinning, because there's laws in the spirit that you and I haven't been dealt with yet. Yeah. These are laws, and they sit in different dimensions inside of us. Up here in your spirit, where your spirit is born again, it's called paleogenesis. Your spirit is fully righteous, fully holy, fully perfect, to the full measure of Christ. But that area, it sits up in your spirit and God just turns a little bit of the power on every now and then and you get a touch every now and then of the power. Some Sundays you're on fire. The next Sunday, guess what happens? The lad is gone. Hey, where brother boy? He, he, he walking around like that. He lost. Why? This tap here has stopped. But we're in a season with God right now where he said, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. Someone has gone through this process. A company of people have been separated for God and in their journey and in their life, now the seed that started in their life as a baby infant form, they've come all the way in through maturity now and they're ready to give birth to the character. There's a company of people called First Fruits. They've gone through the refiner's fire. They've gone through the purging. They've gone through this walk that no one else wanted to go through. And God has called them out for this season right now. Oh, tell somebody this morning, I'm part of that company. That's where I want to be. That's where you want to be. You want to be a part of the first fruits company. According to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, he's talking about a people that are referred to as first fruits. They follow the Lamb wherever he goeth, says the word. These are those who are redeemed from among men. These are people that have gone, even though they're in the body, they have gone further on with God. They went through something that no one else wanted to go through. They are the redeemed. They were among men, but they now are the redeemed. They've come through a process. God has been wooing his people through this process for the last 20 years. Church has never changed so much in the last 20 years like it has right now. We got people running here, running there. We got pastors, prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers. We got bishops, archbishops. We got everyone. 
But God has had his finger and his eye upon one company of people. He's walked them through the waters of Passover. He's walked them through Pentecost and filled them with the Holy Spirit. But now he's called them out into this last part, into the kingdom. That's where character is. Character. Full character. You know, we get to this part of the journey and we're looking at something that God has been waiting for millenniums. He has been looking and searching and watching over this company of people called First Roots, according to Hebrews chapter 14 4. They were not defiled with any woman. They were cast as virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These are the redeemed from among men. Being the first fruits of God and to the Lamb, in their mouth there was found no deceit. They are without fault. They stand before the throne room. See, that word phrase, stand before the throne room, doesn't mean I stand here like this and God's there and I look at God and God's looking at me. All it is, is a prophetic gesture. See, when... Elijah and all the men of God would stand in the presence of God. That was their rightful position to stand on behalf of humanity to minister and to speak. That's your position. Christ has put us into that position. That's a prophetic gesture of where you really are. How can you stand before God Almighty and the character is not dealt with? It's not equal with, one with God. Flesh cannot stand in the presence of God. This people have gone through a process. They're redeemed, they're called out, they're sanctified, they're a peculiar people. They've gone through a process to have no deceit in their mouth. They speak truth only. You will find no mixture in their language. And really, the mouth there is the summer. It's the character. You will see what righteousness looks like for what it is. Character to character, face to face. In church life right now, we're struggling to know what is holiness and what's righteousness because we got the pastor, he's playing up. We got, we got the deacon, he's playing up or she's playing up. We got people gambling and betting. We got people that are, are smoking and drinking. And, um, you know, in the word it says that there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. And then you have the rights and the laws of Nazareth, a man who takes on a vow that no strong drink will touch his mouth. People of God, this is very clear. But the Word of God has been watered down for many. And now we have a problem in society because not even the church knows what holiness looks like. Holiness just means to be set apart. You aren't supposed to look like the world. You're unique. You don't live like the world. You don't habitate the character of the nature of the world. See, the nature of the world is coded by a number in the book of Revelation, 666. Six is the number of the day that man, God created man. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But it's a mystery. It's hidden in a number. We're all running around looking for this number. Where's the number, Pastor Manny? Where is it? Don't get 666. I've seen people that are tattooed with the number 666. It don't mean a hill of beans. This is spiritual meaning. This is a character that's inside of mankind. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's coded into our DNA now. It doesn't matter if a chip comes or it doesn't come. The character of this was given to Adam. When Adam fell, he took on this character. It was in his own DNA. He had no longer a desire for things of God. He had a lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life was dominating Adam's life now. 
And it was coded in a mystery. And God said to Adam and to Eve, He said, you, you and the serpent, get out. Where was the serpent? The serpent was wrapped up in Adam's DNA. It was in his character. Oh, Pastor Mandy, this is heavy. That's why people keep on sinning. That's why people keep on murdering. That's why people keep on fornicating. People keep on gambling, alcohol, domestic violence. Say whatever you want. These are natural manifestations of a law that was passed down through humanity because Adam, the first Adam, was the federal head of humanity and because he was the daddy of humanity, that character fell down. Everyone now sinned and was in death. This character permeated through humankind. The after effect was this. We started dying younger. Sin crept into our life. Sickness came upon us. People were wondering how Noah and all these lads lived to six, seven hundred. Methuselah, 937 years of age. All these people, how did they live that long? People of God, they were walking with the Spirit of God. They weren't dominated by the flesh. Even scientists will teach that inside of you, the law of immortality is not outside of you, it's in you. We just haven't cracked the code yet. It's in us. For the same spirit that raised him up, the law of resurrection, the same spirit that raised up Jesus is in you. Where is it? In me. It's in my spirit. There's laws in the spirit realm that we are yet to understand. And so today, we're beginning to understand now that when you were born again, your spirit was born again. And the fullness that's in there is called the Christ. He's righteous, he's holy, he's perfect. But guess what? Because this area is so perfect, in here, your soul, you can be weak. You got flesh. You can be weak. Your spirit is red hot for God, but your soul is weak. That's why we need prayer, worship, intercession, truth of the word, and fellowship with the general assembly. People of God, they're the five things that you need in your life to grow. People that don't want to come to church, you know why? That's a spirit of delusion. It's put into their mind now, and they believe the average local church is worth nothing. That's a spirit that has deceived people from gathering together. That's why you don't grow. Too many little know-it-alls in the kingdom. You know them people? They know it all and no life. The know-it-alls and they all in problems. The know-it-alls and they all broken up. Yeah, but I know God. Marriage distort, no job, broke, poor, poverty, everything. Yeah, but I know it all. That's this deceptive nature. Today I'm speaking the word of truth because I love you enough to tell you your spirit, you can be weak. That's why you got to get to church. That's why you got to get to prayer. That's why you get to around brothers and sisters in the fellowship. That's why you got to pay your tithe and your offering. These are all fundamentals to strengthen your spirit. Elkanai went every year to minister before God. It shows the principle of what your spirit man needs to be doing. Some of us, our spirit man is weak as. He's just hanging on. Just hanging on to get to church on Sunday. I can just make church. This lad's gone. It's nearly 11 o'clock. Man, I need him to stop here. I need to go home. I've got football. I've got a roast on. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really just need to be home sitting down. You know? You know, come on. Come on, Pastor Manny. Come on. I'm very, very busy, Pastor Manny. That's because your spirit is weak. Even though he's fully righteous, fully holy, he can be weak. So you got to exercise in the spirit. Everyone go exercise. exercise. How do I exercise? Prayer, worship, intercession, truth of the word, general fellowship. Get to the house. Your spirit man works out. These things will strengthen your spirit man to turn it on in your soul. Because your soul, that's where you're weak. The soul holds the will of man. It's where the motions, the intellect, it's where 
creativity comes from. It's even where you make decisions. It's your reasoning. It's where your emotional realm takes over sometimes. And that your soul is very weak. If you're not hearing the Spirit enough and not tuned in with the Spirit, you will make decisions for your life out of your soul. Who's ever made decisions out of their soul? Yeah. yeah. You know when you're crying and somebody said something about you on Facebook? And somebody really said something on Facebook about me. And I'm really upset now. That's the soul. Get off for it if you got to get off for it. I had to cancel everything. And if the soul is dominating your life, you're making your decisions out of your hurts and out of all these problems and confusion, eventually you'll forget about the Spirit of God in your life and you just walk out of your, out of your soul all day long. No concern about your calling, the vision, the ministry, what God has set you apart for. Everyone say there's one more. But you walk in a physical body. You have a spirit, you have a soul, but you've got a physical body. It's called tripartite in scripture. Worship God in spirit, soul and body. Blameless before him in spirit, soul and body. First Timothy says that. Worship the Lord thy God in spirit, soul, body. All of you. All of you. Allow the wisdom of God to flow through you. Touch your soul. Make sure that you're making righteous decisions. Execute it out in the natural realm then. God gets a hold of a man and he's been bashing his woman for however long. When the Spirit of God gets to you and ministers to you, touches your soul, guess what happens to your natural man? If it's strong enough, the Spirit of the Word will touch your soul and you'll start getting convicted. And then eventually, you won't be doing this anymore, but you'll be doing this. Mm, love you. <laughs> love you, love you. Your wife is supposed to be the representation of your glory. A man that has a wounded woman, I tell you what, God can revive you, but you've got to be willing to be, be in a position to be taught, mentored, there are things in marriage life that goes on. I tell you what, I don't want to go into that. We need a conference on man and woman. But there's a ministry where God can heal these things. Marriage is not a revelation given by man. It was a divine revelation given by God. Why do you think the enemy is going after marriage oneness? Because he knows if two become one, he got no power. The power of when a man and a woman walk together, it's not a competition about keeping tits and tats on one another. You did this, I did that. You did, oh, yeah, lad, you know. Oh, yeah, what about you? You're keeping tits and tats on one another. That's not marriage. That's condemnation. That's a spirit operating in your marriage. It's separating you more and more. You've got to become one. One. So here we're entering into the day of his atonement. God has worked in you. He put a seed in you and the seed was Christ. You didn't know it, but when you were born again, he put a little seed in you. That little seed, God's been cultivating and watching it over your life for so long. The seed ultimately has to give birth to something. It's not just about the seed. The seed has got to transform to whatever the fruit is, the life. And the life here, the fruit here, is Christ within. It's the fruit of divine nature. It's called the Christ. A lot of people think the word Christ there is, is a person. No, it's a noun, meaning it's a function. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is a function. It's a person, but it's his function in you. The kingdom of God is within. Where's the kingdom? Where's the kingdom? Where is it? It's not outside of you. It's in you. 
The word kingdom in the Greek is two words put together. The first word is basilia, and dom is dominion. Basilia means the power and the authority of a word as a ruler. Dom, D-O-M, means dominion by character. So it's the rule and the reign that's coming through you by a character. What's the character that's doing this? Through dominion. Christ within. Adam had dominion in the beginning. Adam had this powerful relationship with God and the character that he had, it was like dominion flowing through him. Everything he saw, he could name. The character was expressing itself through him, through dominion. As a matter of fact, he said, when it came out of him, it says that there was four rivers that compassed around about all of the Garden of Eden. The garden means the relationship that Adam had with God and the way that God expressed this relationship with him in the fullness of his character was that water broke out. Water speaks of life. And this character would flow all around the garden. The water here speaks about his very own character. It's God. Adam was walking with God and in his relationship with dominion, everything in Eden was being touched by these rivers of life. Havilah, Babylon, all of these, Pishon, all of these things. It was the governance of God expressing himself through him. But we don't know this. We think that Adam was just walking around with Uncle had leaf there. Six pack, walking around black hair. He walked around calling out, Hippo, come here. Turtle, come here. Elephant, stay there. Tiger, hide under tree. We think that. The whole book of Genesis, the beginning is called, it's metaphoric language. He's using natural descriptions trying to describe to you how the relationship with man was with God for the first time. It was like a garden of Eden, meaning a love relationship. Every time God spoke to him, it sounded like cool. It's wind coming out from the spirit realm, but it was God's voice. He's using natural illustrations to describe his relationship with God. So when Adam walked in the cool of the day, in the spirit, we think, oh, what does that mean? It simply means God was walking with him by voice. God changed himself from the spirit realm and became audible voice to Adam. And God said, when I came to him, it was like the cool in the day. Nowhere in scripture did Adam ever see God face to face like this. It doesn't say that in scripture. It says that God would come down in the cool of the day as a voice. God's spirit, Adam was a man. He was walking around on the physical dimension. Guess what happened? God changed himself from spirit realm and he changed himself into audible voice and he spoke to Adam. Guess what Adam could do? Adam had the ability to hear that realm of voice. We've lost this. We're communicating with Buddha. We're communicating with Mundra. We're communicating with Bularu, Babadu, Gibidu, Wibidu, and Skibidu. We are communicating with everything else. Yeah, we're silly. We've lost the ability to hear the voice of our Father. You are spirit, tell somebody this morning. That means you're compatible with God to pick up with God. We've got to talk this language into us. We've got to walk with this language. You are spirit. You have a soul and you walk in a physical body. But your spirit is compatible with God where you can hear him and talk with him. You pick it up sometimes. God said to go to church. Yes, he did. Sometimes we try to flip that, that the gammon voice on. God said, I need to stay home. That's not God's voice. God, that's your own voice. You, 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 that voice coming from me, this lad here, soul voice. Uh, I need to go to the cave for a few years and just, you know, I need to find myself. No, that's soul voice. The Spirit of God will tell you, get to Shiloh. Get to the house of Obadiah. That's where the ark is. See, we, 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 we deceive ourselves. 
We deceive ourselves. We want to walk around and do whatever we want to do. But God is trying to say, no, get to me, hear my voice, and I tell you what, I'm going to begin to start reaping a harvest of people. Revelation chapter 14, verse 15. Let's have a look at this word. Now, I talked on verse 14. We know that this is all about the harvest. It's about a first fruits people. He said here, he said this. He said, I saw one who was on a white cloud. And it was the son of man having his head as a golden crown. And in his, in his hand, he had a sharp sickle. I'm not going to teach on that. I'm just going to highlight and say to you, the white cloud is the purity of God's word. The son of man, that refers to Jesus. This is in your life where he wants to speak with you because he, he is the champion. He has a golden crown. That word golden crown there is Stephanos. It means that Jesus became the champion of all champions. He's won the battle for you, but when he comes to you, he comes to you like, like a cloud. What's in clouds? Rain. He will come to you with a revelation to tell you what he's done for you. That's what John's looking at. John's looking at, he can see the language of what it looks like when the Spirit of God comes to you as a champion. He wants to talk to you. He has a sharp sickle, sharp sickle meaning the word of God. And it says that another angel came out of the temple. Everyone say temple. That word there is naos. It's not heron. Two words for the Greek word temple. Heron means the physical temple over in Jerusalem. Naos means a spiritual temple. The angel came out of the naos. The word angel there means message. He saw this message come out of the temple, out, out of this temple. It's going to minister to you. It's not outside of you, it's in you. Where's Christ? In you. Where's the Holy Spirit? Where's He talking to you? It's all in you. So here He said, I saw an angel come out of the temple. The word angel, message. It, it was a message that came out of the naos. You're the spiritual dwelling place, temple of God. This message is finally coming out of you. It's finally being heard in you. You'll finally get in a revelation that He wants to mature you. You've grown up. You've become mature enough where He can reap now this character. The angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in the sickle the word of God. Reap for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is... Where's the harvest? In me. It's in you. The word earth there is you. You're the earth. You were created out of the dust of the earth. This is symbolic language. The harvest of the earth is ripe. There's finally come a people that are fully mature now. They're fully mature. Oh. So he sat on the cloud and he thrust in the sickle onto the earth. And the earth was finally reaped. There's got to come a time in church age where we've all got to grow up. We can't keep on being babies. That's why Jesus said, Woe to them who give suck at the time of the end. Those who are still on the breast and being weaned on milk. Because too many Christians are like babies in their understanding. They've never grown up. I call them wheelbarrow Christians. They only go as far as pastor can take them. I'll get you to church. They're called wheelbarrow Christians. They only come to church because pastor picked you up. They only come to the house because you're praying and continually doing everything for them, getting them everything and anything and everything. And I can't do it without you, Pastor. I call them wheelbarrow Christians. They got no legs. And the moment that they don't get the yes from the pastor, guess what happened? That church is wrong. It's demonic. That lad, yeah, that pastor, oh, no, don't go there. Why? Because you didn't grow up.
This whole process, God's been looking for you to mature up. See, you come to the house, you're going to be tested. At home, you don't get tested like this. This is the refiner's fire. Red hot. Can't play games in this dimension. Come to pastor, try and accuse everything and everyone, blame everyone else for your problems. But you've got to look in the mirror and finally say to yourself, it's me. That's why everything's going wrong, because of me. I've made the two decisions. I did this. I did that. I did this. I took this. I did this. I did that. And now I'm reaping all of this. Why? Why are we saying this? Because God wants to heal you. He wants to get you set free. He wants to transform your life. I was a drug addict. I was a bad lad. I gambled everything. Still come to church on Sunday, but I had all these problems. And I didn't realize that God was like a refiner's fire and a fool of soap. He was going to wash me, burn me, purge everything out of me. And he was going to go to operation on me. And guess what? He was going to do it with me being alive and standing up on my feet. Amen. People of God, you don't get no anesthesia for this one. You don't get put to sleep for this one. You've got to stay up in the kingdom. He's going to go to work on you with a knife. And he's going to do the operation on you while you're standing on your feet. And guess what? It's going to do you good. For the first time in your life, he's going to work on you. <laughs> I was in the back of a car. I've got five minutes. I was in the back of the car. I loved Jesus. I was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was still smoking. Well, how? Are you all right there this morning talking to anyone? Yeah, we can all act the acting. I tell you that right now. That's why Jesus says the hypocrites. You bunch of hypocrites. It means you're an actor. We don't need to go over to Hollywood to find the best actors. I'm telling you. We all could have had a couple of global, you know, nominees. We all could have had a couple of them gold statues. You know them acting? You know, you go to pastor. <laughs> pastor! Pastor, all this is going wrong right now. Pastor! <laughs> and then that eye like that, eh? Knowing what you did. But you go to pastor crying and going silly. <gasps> oh, pastor, help me, pastor. <laughs> when pastor trying to help you, and do, well, all right, what do you need? <sighs> I need rent. I, I need food. Pastor said, all right, but what did you do with your money? Oh, the enemy got me, he took me down there to bet and gamble. I was on the stinking machine. That's how we go. That's how we go. This is very real, but for your life. This is real because we've got so many strongholds and demonic strongholds in our life. So pastor, he's going to do this. Guess what he's going to do? He will give you bread, food and things like that, help you out where he can. But he's also going to give you the spirit of the word. the correction that is needed for your life. We want all the good things, but soon as that word correction come, everyone back up, or even worse, we all get super spiritual. No, no, that's not for me. Right now, Jesus, Holy Spirit, get off me. That's not the Lord. No, I cannot do that. That is not God. We all get hyper spiritual. No, that's just a muck up and a cover up. You just want to live in that sin still. You've got to be dealt with. This has to be dealt with in your life. So I was stealing and robbing. I was lying from God. I was taking the little envelope to come down to the tithes and offering and I'd steal that $20 out of the tithes and offering. I'd put toilet paper in there and get them and put it in. This was me. This was pastor before he was transformed. And wifey was saying, why are we still struggling in our finances? Because I was going there, give me the envelope. I'd take the money out and keep it and I'd get him and put that envelope in tithes and offering. This is the character that was robbing us. I can say it because you know why? God's delivered me. Took 20 years. 20 years. Bit of a work. Bit of a journey. But I tell you what, I wouldn't change anything. The Lord had me in the bus and when he delivered me from stealing and all the money I was robbing from my own house and smoking, I was in the back of a bus and the Spirit of the Lord hit me. And in the spirit realm, I saw this big canker worm coming up out of my mouth. 
It was about this big. And the canker worm came up and I spewed it out. Not in the natural, this was in the spirit. I could see it. And everyone was screaming in the bus, Hog, oh, help him out, get him to the hospital. He needs, quickly, his pancreas is about to explode. People were screaming out in the bus. Mum saw it and she reckoned, oh, Pastor Selena saw it. She said, nah, the hand of the Lord's on this lad. He's getting delivered right here, right now. You know, church life, we want everything to be in order. We want everything to be perfect. Oh no, you can't do this, you can't do that. Philip, he just looked down and said, come down here, I'm going to baptise you right now. We didn't have to wait 10 years. There's a move of God sometimes when the Spirit moves. You've got to know when God's moving. I was, he was moving in the bus. I spewed it up and the canker word came out. And the Lord delivered me that night, stopped smoking, never picked up a cigarette ever again, stopped stealing, tithing from that night on. Didn't stop. And God, because the canker worm in Scripture, it means to devour the inheritance. There were characteristics in me that was robbing me of my inheritance. And the Lord had to break it out of me. Come on, give God all the glory. He can do it. I know He will. But you've got to be able to submit yourself to the process. It is so hard because you have to humble yourself. The big lad who has all the dreams and the visions had to be humbled. I tell you what, the ministry of a wife is phenomenal. She has to bear all of this lad's issues. God, I tell you what, I really want to talk on marriage. God wants to set people free, mate. You think you've gone to flight? God, I'm telling you what, your, your inheritance, what God wants to do with your life, you haven't even glimpsed it yet. The calling and what God wants to use you, I tell you what, it's so great, but God has to deal with these things in our life first to set you to flight. If you're not healed in this move, guess what happens? The danger is you'll go out and you'll hurt others. Because you wounded, so you teach like that because you've been wounded. That's why you need to be in the house. He said, verse 17, the other angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and also having a sharp sickle, the other angel came out from the altar. Everyone say altar. That's the altar of incense. It means prayer, worship, intercession. This angel had the place of the altar. The altar there is the intent of God. When you pray, you pray with an intent. You don't just go to God and say, well, I'm going to pray to God. God, you're wonderful. Lord, you're beautiful. Lord, you're great. Your mercies. No, when you're in trouble, you go to God very specifically. Father, I'm in trouble. I need to know your will. I've done this. I've done that. There's a prayer inside of us given by the Spirit of God. And this prayer life of intercession, when it breaks out in you, guess what happens? It comes to you like fire. You've never prayed prayer like this. We're always praying for the Ferrari, the big house, and the big job. But your spirit one day will begin to pray with the prayer of the intercession of the Spirit of God's will. Scripture says that. We don't know what we can pray for. But as the Spirit gives utterance, as the Holy Spirit works on your life, you will begin to pray like the Spirit of God needs for you to pray like. I tell you what, there was some prayer in my life. Man, I was in bondage to everything. And the Lord, I was a terrible little flirt. Pastor Manning was a terrible little flirt. Anyone a flirt here? Anyone a flirter? Yeah, you betcha. And this was before me and my wife were married. She loved me endlessly. But a lad, you know, he wanted to be the band. He think he was more than, I, I should have more women. I should be here, I should be doing that. I was a terrible little flirt. And then God got a hold on me, slapped me up and said, she's more than enough for you, lad. I've chosen the best partner for you. The best. God had to work on this area in my life. He says that this angel came out from the altar, altar meaning the intent now who had power over fire. Everyone say fire. It doesn't say hell's fire here, right? 
This is fire from off the altar. It's the fire that touched Isaiah's lip, purged out sin from his own language. This is the fire of God that's going to touch you in the deepest part of your life. We don't pray like this. We don't pray that saying, God, you work on us. Work on me, all my problems. We want God to work on everyone else. Work on Elijah. Work on Annie Rita. Work on Jakita. Father, just work on Pastor Anthony and Selena. Oh, Lord, I just put them before you. And you're the one with the character, with the problem. Oh, yeah, we pray like this. Because we didn't get our way. Pastor never let me get up. I had a dream and a vision. I had revelation coming to me every night. And Pastor won't let me get up. How dare he? Jesus, come to him, meet with him. This is how we pray. This is the demonicness. He said, this is the fire that comes out of the altar. This is a prayer. This is the word of God, the intent of God. He cried with a loud voice saying to him that had the sharp sickle. God is saying that his fire will now reap. It will be purged. It will deal with us. It will cut away the dross. It will remove the darkness. It will do all the things it needs to do. Why? Because you've got to come to a place to grow fully up. This is not hell's fire. This is the refiner's fire. It's God working in you. I didn't know God had to work in me. And he works in you by fire. All consuming fire. He had to deal with my gambling problem, deal with my flirting problem, deal with my smoking problem. I tell you what, I had a list that long and I know all of you are angels. I'm surrounded by angels. I know no one else here has problems. I'm trying to be real with you here today. All that God is trying to say is that he wants to put a fire in your life to purge these areas out that have been robbing you. Unless you humble yourself, you won't allow the process to happen. You won't be transformed. You won't be changed. God wants to transform you and change you today. Can I have the musicians up? He said, thrust in the sickle. Gather the cluster of the vine of the earth. The vine of the earth, it is the harvest of the earth. But now it's you. He says, the vine of the earth, you're the earth. And he's specifically going after one part in your life, the vine. The vine was supposed to produce the grapes. The grapes produce the wine and the wine speaks of the life. Go after the vine. The very thing that Jesus said that you and I needed to be attached to was him. To produce any fruit, we need to be attached to the vine. So God says, go after the vine. Where the life source is. And the angels thrust into the earth and he gathered the vine. He went specifically to the part inside of our life where we were supposed to be producing the life of the Spirit. He's going to go in. He's going to examine closely. Is there a problem in the vine? Is there a problem in that area of their life? I need to examine why they aren't producing. What did Jesus say? He said, if it's not producing... Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. He's going to go to work on you. And the only thing that's going to be left in you is the vine that's connected to him. You're connected to him and the life of the Spirit will flow fully in your life. Today the words felt like a hammer. It's felt like it's been cutting deep. You know why? Time's running out. He wants to gather in his harvest. He wants to see sons and daughters of the Most High. The earth is groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. The earth is waiting. God is waiting to see 
this first fruits company of people to come out on the earth. They'll look like him, they'll talk like him, they'll walk like him, they'll walk in the power and the authority like Jesus. Jesus was just the first prototype. He was the firstborn. The church think that they've done it all. No. Nah. That's why Jesus spoke to the church. He said, you're poor, blind and wretched. I told you to buy gold refined from me in fire. We can't fathom that we've fallen so far from the presence of God and we just operate in doing whatever we want. But God slowly now is getting a people together. You're that company this morning. You're here. I want to encourage you. You might be here for the first time, but you're, you're hearing the calling of God for your life. He wants you to mature up. He'll walk you through the process. It's like fire to you. But this fire is not going to hurt you. It's going to save you. Who's ready for the journey? Let's stand this morning. Who's ready for the journey? Pastor Manny Edwards loves connecting with you through technology like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you would like to partner with us to spread the gospel to thousands of viewers worldwide, contact us at mannyedwardsministries at gmail.com or through PayPal at paypal.me slash meministries to make your donation. Your welcome donation will help us to continue to spread God's word in this end time move. Thank you for listening.